It's a little chilling in here today. It's very cold. Uh, we hope you guys are coping very well with the cold. For my part, it hasn't been the wonderful, uh, the most wonderful time I've ever had. However, we are trying to deal with it. So, Dr. Uh, Lagoke, you are the founder of the Revival of African Pan-Africanism Forum. And it is a platform for discussion for the advancement of Pan-Africanism that contributes to the building to building a universal alliance in the 21st century in order to consolidate an African spiritual, cultural, social, economic, and political identity necessary to tackle Africa's and the African diaspora's challenge. Am I right? Yes. Okay. So is there anything you'd like to tell us a bit more about the revival of Pan uh, Pan-Africanism Forum before we move on with the show? Oh, uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Um... Uh, we believe that Pan-Africanism is the solution for Africa. Okay. And uh, that's why my friends and I, uh, we launched uh, a platform of discussion okay. uh, about Africa's future and Africa's development uh, from the Pan-African perspective in 2007. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've been organizing conferences and when we're trying to bridge the gap between Africans and people of African descent. Okay. And we also engage uh, people who are not African, uh, people of, who are not of African heritage, yes. uh, white people and people of different uh, nationalities, mm -hmm. uh, to join us around the struggle for freedom and justice and, and unity of Africa. That's and uh, this is what we've been doing. And since uh, for the last two years, mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, a particular conference for Thomas Sankara. Okay. Uh, we call it the Thomas Sankara Annual Conference. Okay. And uh, the last one we organized was on October the 12th. Mm -hmm. and 2013 and um, we had more than 100 people we did we organized that conference uh with the collaboration of all african revolution people party okay. friends of the congo and Inso coalition and uh april inc so we've been working also to build uh, a pan-african coalition uh with other organization in the in the, in the city and now uh, so this is what we've been doing we hope to have you back someday to discuss in uh, uh, in detail the the actions that you've been taking uh, with the revival of Pan Africanism Forum, and we hope to mm. have a chance to know more about your work. But today, this show is about Nelson Mandela, the legacy and the unfinished struggle for freedom in Africa. That is the theme, uh, the the theme for our show today. Uh, Nelson Holihaha Mandela, if I'm right, was born in on July 18, 1918. And he passed away on December 5th, 2013, uh, just um, uh, about a month ago. Um, may his soul rest in peace. He was the former leader of the African National Congress and former president of South Africa. He was known for his lifelong struggle against apartheid, um, which is an enforced racial separation system and which was instituted in South Africa in 1948. The ANC um, was soon declared a terrorist organization and banned by the South African government at the time. Mandela was arrested in 1962 and imprisoned for life on terrorist charges, but in 1990, Thanks to the struggle that the South African people led together with many human rights activists worldwide, he regained his freedom. In 1994, Mandela was elected president of South Africa. So, Dr. Legoki, please tell us, who is Nelson Mandela for you? When you hear the name Nelson Mandela, what comes to your mind? Uh, when I hear the name Nelson, let me tell you something uh, you know, before we talk about Mandela. Uh, uh, when I was uh, a teenager uh, uh, back home in, in Ivory Coast, mm -hmm. and uh, I was fortunate you know, to have the desire to be part of anything related to freedom and justice. Okay. And also uh, when I was in high school, uh, Mandela has been one of my heroes. Wow. And um, I, I, I deeply admired him. And then it became a source of curiosity for me, mm -hmm. uh, so that uh, everything I can do, uh, you know, to read more about his life and the struggle of uh, black people in South Africa, you know, this is what I, you know, I also was doing. Uh, so uh, when he became, when he was freed uh, on February 11, 1990, yes. it was one of my dreams because, uh, as I said, I was going upside a couple of dreams. One of my dreams was to see Mandela free one day okay. and become president okay. of South Africa. So when he became the effective president of South Africa in 1994, mm -hmm. it was one of the dreams I had uh, since uh, you know my my my, my, my I would say my 
of uh, my uh, t my teenage age. So now, when today we talk about Mandela, uh, I uh, the thing that I, I see are the following. I see many many virtues and many qualities that we need as human beings and as social activists and as future leaders. With what the qualities are uh, first resilience and consistency, uh, dignity, integrity, and self a sense of service okay. and a sense of uh, of, of, of of detachment, you know, from the, the material world. Mm -hmm. So these are the virtues and the qualities. Uh, that, that I see in Nelson Mandela, mm -hmm. and I use some of those qualities, and then also a sense of humanness. Okay. And uh, by by being human, as uh, he forgave, uh, you know, those who oppress black people in South Africa. So all these are all the qualities we see in Nelson Mandela. And then I am, uh, it's a privilege for me and for my generation, mm -hmm. you know, to be somebody who lives in the time of Nelson Mandela. Okay. So, the the theme of our discussion today um, is the legacy of Nelson Mandela and the unfinished struggle for freedom in Africa. But we would like to have like a, a, a an historical overview of the presence of uh, of the white in South Africa. Uh, can you please give us a historical overview uh, of okay, the I'm going to give, Yeah, we going to be brief. You know, we need to, we have to, to the presence of white in South Africa. Yes, can be uh, uh, linked or can be related. You know, to the Battle of Ceuta in, in, in the northern part of Africa, uh, uh, they undertaken by the Portuguese mm -hmm. uh, because uh, I think Henry the First, who was the king of Portugal, uh, undertook uh, you know, uh, the conquest of that part of Africa, which was controlled you know, by the Italian merchants and many moles. And then uh, after the conquest of Ceuta, I think it is what in 1415. Uh, Portugal undertook an age of, of, of exploration, and later on, Portugal was going to be followed by Spain and many other European uh, countries. So it is when they were going from. Uh, but Dr. Uh, from Dr. Dr. Okay, I don't mean to cut you, but you, you mentioned Henry the First as being the king of Portugal at the time. I believe Henry the First was the king of England, if I'm not wrong. Oh uh, no, I think it's uh, I don't, I don't I maybe that maybe it's another another Henry, but I think. I think it's uh, I think uh, it's uh, I think it's uh, the one I'm talking about might be uh, of uh, uh, Henry Henry I think he was called Henry the Navigator. This is the one I'm talking about. Okay, okay, I see. Okay, okay. So we, we can uh, we can verify the, you know as we talk about uh, uh, monarchies, you know we can we can have different Henrys, but mm -hmm. that's uh, the one I yeah, think Henry I know. Henry the Navigator okay. was indeed the Portuguese. Uh, he was no, the Portuguese right. explorer, as you were mentioning. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No problem. Anyway. So anyway. Uh, uh, we can now, we can, can Henry or John, you know, we can, we will talk about that later on, right? Okay, so, but Henry, uh, but after, after the Battle of Ceuta, there was an age of exploration undertaken by European nations, and Portugal was, in that age of exploration, you know, the most important, uh, uh, the most important power, and it is when they were going to the source, because as is in Ceuta, uh, it was a very strategic uh, in, uh, location where people can uh, were buying wheat and then the spices that were coming you know, from the, from India. Mm -hmm. So they wanted to go to the source uh, you know, to, in order to control that trade of, of, of the spices. And this is how they were going from coast to coast. And it is when they were going in, in the Cape of, of Good Hope, they were uh, you know, taking the time there to, st to stop a little bit to replenish you know, the boats and buy you know, some goods or buy some, uh, you know, some, some meat from the Koi in, in the western part of South, in the western part of, in the southern part of Africa. And later on, uh, the Dutch were going to be the first in order to set some angels eyes on that area, and they settled there, and in 1652, the, uh, that area was going to become a colony of the Dutch. And later on, the British were going to set also the eyes uh, during the contest of colonialism, and they were going to conquer the Cape Colony in 1795. And it is around 1770 that, uh, you know, the Bulls were going to have the first conflict uh, with, you know, the indigenous people 
of the sandmen and the koi men in South Africa. The sandmen were bushmen and the koi were herdsmen. And later on, we are going to see in the context of Nifikani and Tifikani, which were, uh, which were about uh, fight uh, between uh, African kingdoms, or among African kingdoms, and between African kingdoms and the European. And in that area of struggles and co permanent war about raiding of Africans, the kingdom were going to be dismantled as the bulls were going to undertake uh, what we call you know, the, the, the great migration of the bulls you know, from the Cape Colony. Later on, they were going to create the Orange Free State and Transvaal. And later on, the British were going to be in control of Natal, and, uh, uh, which uh, after the defeat of the Zulu people by, you know, by, by the bulls. So it's a, that's a brief overview. So it is in 1910 then, when after the war between the bulls and the British, which, uh, which occurred in 1899, to 1902, that the, the white people, British and the Bulls, they came together. The first state, the, bulls are the, the Natal, let, uh, let me finish on that. The Natal, uh, the, the Cape Colony, the Orange Free State, and Transvaal came together to create uh, uh, you know, the Union of South Africa. And it is in reaction to that, that in 1912, that the African National Congress was created. You know, and uh, in order to fight for freedom you know, and justice for, for black people in South Africa. Okay, but the, uh, the South African uh, as a country, uh, South Africa as a country gained its independence from England in 1934. Uh, can you elaborate on the circumstances in which it received its independence in 1934? Can I, can I, can I, can I, can I, I hear you properly? Yeah, I, I would like to know if you can elaborate a little bit on, in the, on the circumstances in which South Africa gained its independence from the British Empire in 1934. Oh, uh, but uh, you, know, uh, you know, the most important thing uh, that we need to know about the the, uh, the the independence of South Africa. That I think that the most important thing is uh, uh, f uh, what I was talking about, which is uh, 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 f that that the creation of South Africa because. Uh, when uh, South Africa became, uh, when the Union of South Africa was created uh, in, 19, uh, uh, in 1910, uh, and we're not to go into details, we knew already uh, that uh, it was in the hands uh, of uh, the Bulls as the British wanted to withdraw, and so that the Bulls uh, can continue to, in order to, you know, to, to claim the right in order to conquer or to, right to, you know, to govern South Africa. Now, uh, it is uh, when we, it is when uh, the Bulls were defeated by the, after the war that I was talking about in, 19, in 1899 and 1902, that the British seemed to have a sense of guilt that maybe they needed to, uh, to repair, and this is how uh, later on they were going to give the opportunity to the, to the other one in order to continue. So this is not what I may say about, you know, the first Anglo war. And later on, you know, there were going to be different type of, of, of war between, you know, the Bulls and the, and the British. So that, let, this is what I may say so that we can continue. Okay, so um, you mentioned uh, pretty much the creation of the ENC, the African National Congress, which was the party in which Mandela uh, was active and he, uh, he, he, he led for years. Um, can you please tell us a little bit about the context in which the ANC was created? Um... So, like, like, you know, for you know, because we know, for instance, uh, that in 1948, we know, you know, this is what we heard when we were growing up, uh, you know, that, that system of oppression, which is about the separateness between the whites, uh, the bulls, and, you know, uh, the, it's about the geographic separation, the social, economic, and political separation apartheid. But before that, there was another system. Uh, when uh, uh, the, the minds of the bull was 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 uh, discovered in Kimberley, and then Kimberley and and diamonds, Kimberley and Johannesburg, and South Africa was going to be uh, one of the most uh, uh, industrious uh, uh, region in, uh, in 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 Africa. Uh, many people were going to work, like in the farms, uh, in the mines, in different parts uh, of uh, of South Africa. In that environment and in that context. Uh, the bulls or uh, British were trying to be a little bit different. 
but they believe that they have the right, you know, to, 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 to make sure that the jobs uh, be in the mines, uh, in the farms, uh, be wherever, need to go first, you know, to the booths or to the Africaners. And then there was already that discrimination and, uh, uh, and all that, con that con consciousness of superiority of the Africaners over black people, over, over blacks. So this is one thing that we need to know. So it is in that environment of oppression and repression and exploitation and dispossession and uh, of the land uh, and the mines and the resources the taking by, uh, from the black from, from the blacks that uh, black people decided in order to try and do something. So when they saw that during that war, that the 1989 war to 19, 19, uh, 1902 that uh, the British and the Bulls fought, and the black people fought along each side. But when they realized that after that war, uh, those British and the, and the Bulls decided to come together and then to try and put it into place a system of oppression and discrimination to continue the oppression of black people, that you know, the indigenous people or the indigenous people of South Africa came together. At that time, we could not talk any longer about the, the, the kingdoms, because in the 19th century, the kingdom of Zulu, the kingdom of Soto, the, the Bele kingdom, and the Greek island, all those kingdoms were already destroyed, either by the Bulls or by the British, because, you know, we talk also, uh, people, because in the history of South Africa, there is a, a very important moment we call the Frontier War, because as they were fighting for land and resources, they were going to have, we were going to see different types of wars, and I was talking about that in the context of Africa, and we call that Unificani or Difficani, which is about crushing and raising and do wars. So this is what I can say about that. So it is in reaction that that, that was the environment in which uh, the, the African National Congress was to be created, you know, by African leaders. Okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Lagoki. Um, my next question uh, is, what made the, um, the system of white domination in last longer in South Africa than in other parts of the African continent? Because um, South Africa was not the only country that was uh, colonized um, by, by, by the, by the uh, European countries. Yes, yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, Farida. Uh, one thing we need to know of, uh, is, you know, in the beginning I was talking about, uh, in the, when he started the interview, I was talking about how, uh, you know, uh, the Portuguese and then the, the British, uh, when they started doing that age of exploration, you know, they were going from coast to coast and they were, so they, they, you know, they took some, some meat, they were buying some meat, you know, from the Koi men. But, uh, the Dutch decided, you know, to settle there. Right, so it was what in 1652. Uh, during that that time, it was slavery. So they were, uh, the European in general, they were coming to Africa, taking uh, you know the you know people from Africa and to the Americas and to different parts so that they can be used as slaves. But the Dutch decided to go there and settle in an environment of slavery. And then when they get there to to to, to settle, it was before the Berlin Conference. Right? And it is uh, before the colonial period that the European were going to undertake in the 19th century. That's first thing. And second, with the industrialization of, uh, of, uh, of, of South Africa, with Kimberley and, and Johannesburg, with the mine, the gold, and, and when the diamond that, that were discovered, it was, you know, that, that discovery was going to give a competitive advantage you know, to that area, to, you know, to, uh, to, to, to South Africa. And then uh, companies were going to invest capital, they were going to invest uh, uh, money, they were going to do everything possible in order to undertake an industri uh, like in the, the industrialization of that part of Africa, which was going to be one of the first uh, uh, few regions to be industrialized in Africa. Second reason. And third, uh, with the consciousness of the African nationalism, that the belief that, you know, they are, they, they, you know, they're superior to other people. So all those things, you know, put together, gave, and then with the support, with the support with, of England, was, England was going to become the most important uh, power in the 19th century in the world, and they were, you know, they were already, uh, you know, uh, in the, the, the most, one of the most important powers, like in the 17th, 18th century, but in the 18th and 19th century, England was one of the most important powers in the world. And 
uh, there was a British official who was talking about how, you know, when they saw that the French were gaining ground in Africa, they wanted to conquer the whole continent of Africa, you know, from, from, you know, from, from Cape uh, to, to, to Cairo. So it was also like in line with the vision of colonialism that, that the British wanted to consolidate the power. So uh, this also was going to uh, contribute, you know, to the reinforcement of the you know white white supremacy in South Africa. Now, when the Bulls now take over and then they decide you know to put into place the system and in that environment when the ANC was you know was uh, there were people who were supporting who were a member of the Communist Party and there were people who believed in communism in an environment uh, of, of the Cold War uh, the, then the, 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 the West was supporting you know the the powers and the state that were fighting against communism, as the ANC was being associated with communism and terrorism, so it was difficult, you know, for you know, for our for our brothers, you know, to undertake. A, 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 I can say, I can, what can I say? I will say, it was difficult for them, you know, to to you know to shorten, you know, the life, you know, of that that the system of oppression on which they were, you know, for more than three hundred years in South Africa. Okay, thank you, Dr. Legoki. Um we have just kind of like reviewed the historical uh, uh, context in which, you know, uh, the apartheid was generated and was created. And then we will take a small break and resume in about two to three minutes. Uh, and when we come back, we will be discussing the, um, the hardcore work of Nelson Mandela. Meanwhile, dear listeners, please let me give you our studio line number, which is 240-813-4996. Plus one two four zero eight one three four nine nine six. For those of you guys who live outside the U.S., we will be very happy to have you guys call in, ask questions to Dr. Lagoki, our guest. Uh, also, to, you know, if you just want to participate to the discussion, don't hesitate to call us. We will be back soon. We hope you are enjoying the show so far. Just stay tuned. Uh, thank you. This is Farida Nabrema. <laughs> Welcome back, dear listeners. Thank you so much. We hope you enjoy the music, which comes from South Africa, Fuse Kemisi, uh, which is an, a, a Southern African traditional uh, band. Uh, thank you so much again for being with us today. We are discussing um, the history of the apartheid and uh, the struggle of Nelson Mandela. So in the first part, we kind of like covered the history of the domination of South Africa, the white domination of South Africa. And now in this second part, we will be discussing the work of Nelson Mandela. But before we move on, please let me give you once again our studio line, which is 240-813-4996, 240-813-4996, in case you want to be a part of the discussion or just ask a question to our guest, Dr. Nyaka Lagoki. We'll be very happy to have you. So Dr. Lagoki, thank you for being with us today thank you very much okay. so as i was saying we will now tackle the hardcore work of nelson mandela uh you know um i, I pretty much assume that uh most people know who nelson mandela was um, a lot of people just like you said see him as a hero as a model um, but unfortunately some people believe that nelson mandela has failed his people be they believe he has not done enough for the for the main reason like there are different reasons but one of them is that once he became president um he hasn't made any strong change you know in, he hasn't brought any strong change in south africa as the whites still control the majority of the um, economy of south africa there's still a huge um economic inequality uh, in South Africa and that is one of the reasons why some people believe he filled his country he filled his people and he filled Africa and he should not be considered as a hero what is um, uh, your intake on that what do you what do you think about this uh, uh, yeah, I've, uh, I have heard uh, you know uh, such comments about uh, the, the legacy of Nelson Mandela mm -hmm. and some people have some of them are valid points uh, some of them are valid points uh, because uh, when um, Nelson Mandela became president in 1994, uh, less that uh, uh, when the ANC was about to take over in South Africa, it was in the context of uh, at the end of the Cold War, if we can say that. There was a crumbling of the, of, of, of the, of the Berlin Wall and also uh, uh, the implosion of the Soviet bloc and the, the socialist and communist doctrines uh, our vision of, of, of the world 
where like in a in a in a situation of uh, of uh, of weakness, you know, compared to you know the, the world of, of, of capitalism. So our the leaders in South Africa could not were not were, did not think bold enough, you know, to, to to reclaim or to claim you know socialism or or, or or communism in the way they wanted to govern South Africa. And second, we also saw the triumph of liberal of the neoliberalism, and uh, with uh, the implementation of the, the, the programs that were coming from the, the IMF and the World Bank mm -hmm. in Africa and different parts of the world. This is the environment in which South Africa was to negotiate on on, on several fronts, on, on the political front, and all, after I'm talking about the ANC, they were supposed to negotiate on the political front, on the economical front. So you see, on the political front. Yes. Uh, they succeeded, you know, to the manage, you know, to conquer power. But on the economic front, there were pressure coming from uh, from the international finance, you know, from different parts in the world or from European countries, for them, you know, to walk away from, mm -hmm. you know, the, you know, the, 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 from what they put in the Freedom Charter in 1955. Uh, one of the one of the one of the, the claims was, uh, for instance, you know, the nationalization of mines and so and so. Mm -hmm. Now, when people say that, we, I will respect that. But what people should really need to understand that in five years, it is impossible to, you know, you know, to erase the stigma of more than 300 years of white domination in South Africa. Okay. So this is one thing people should, should, have, should have in mind when they are talking about the legacy of Nelson Mandela. Mm -hmm. Now, when the ANC, there are four things that we need to, to look at when we are talking about, uh, you know, the goals of the ANC. Uh, first, they wanted to build uh, a democratic South Africa. Uh, second, they wanted one man, one vote. And third, they wanted an inclusive South Africa in which, you know, the, the rights of, of everyone were going to be respected, you know, the majority and the minorities. It could be uh, ethnic, racial, or uh, gender. So these are the three. And the fourth, now, the reconstruction of the country. So out of those four goals, mm -hmm. three, they achieved three. It is only about the reconstruction or taking back the land, you know, from the Europeans, or from the Africaners, and from the European, from the corporation, and then also nationalizing the mines, and maybe on that front, we can say that, you know, they decided to compromise in order, you know, to, to give some time, you know, to those people who have, you know, uh, those resources, you know, for, before they even claiming to take them back. So, out of the four goals, the four major goals that I just mentioned, the ANC, uh, under the leadership of Nelson Mandela, they have achieved three. So, if Nelson Mandela has come out of jail and he has renounced to one man, one vote, then we will see that he has failed his people. But today, the people who have the power in South Africa, the political power, are black people in South Africa. Let me stop yeah, you there. Yeah, you yeah, said yeah. that the political mm. power that the, in South Africa lays in the hands of the black people. Uh, but political power is supposed to help erase inequality. How come the black people have political power and there is still inequality towards the white the black people, how, why, yeah. don't they, why are, they, are, are they not able to use that political power to, uh, to, to, to end injustice in South Africa? Yeah, that's a very, very important question. But again, uh, let, me, let me stress that in five years, it is not possible to erase you know, the stigma of injustice, uh, of, of, of 300 years of injustice and oppression and dispossession in South Africa. So all the people who are talking about Nelson Mandela, they need to understand that five against more than 300 years, I don't know how I'm going to express myself for them to understand that even if, even if they have nationalized all the mines, even if they are taking back the land from all the white people in South Africa, mm -hmm. they were not going to be able in five years to erase the stigma of, 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 of the dispossession in South Africa. So second, now, your question uh, is going to lead us you know, to talk about uh, the flaws of, 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 of human nature and the flaws and the lack of leadership also in South Africa. Because Mandela tried, uh, like, the goal of, like, let's say, his, his purpose was to take back power, the power from the white, you know, to give it back to, to, you know, to the majority in South Africa. 
Now, after one term, he left the power so that so that Tabun Biki will not can be the president. And later on, Jacob Zuma. And it is because you know, our, the leaders who came after Nelson Mandela are not seeing how they can undertake you know, the right way to try and solve the issues in South Africa. Even if, even if the, the, the state of South Africa had all the capital of the world, there is still need, you know, they still need the brain, the ideas, and the commitment and the involvement of the people, of the individuals and citizens of South Africa in order to rebuild South Africa. And on that front, I don't see how they're engaging uh, like efficiently you know, the communities and then, then the, the, the citizens and individuals in South Africa so that those people can take into their hands uh, you know, uh, you know, the, the right you know, to de develop you know, the communities so that they can be also you know, the masters of their destiny and the masters of self-development, the masters of self-reliance and self-sufficiency self sufficiency in South Africa. So this is uh, how I will explain why in South Africa, uh, you know, some, some, some people, are, and of course, you know, there are some people, some leaders who are feeling the, you know, the, you know, the, the constituencies because, uh, you know, maybe they became suddenly rich and then, you know, they think that, you know, that's the right way for them, you know, to try and empower themselves. So, and they may not be looking at the community the way they should. So this is also, you know, one of the things, you know, that, 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 is, that is going on in South Africa. And that is not a very pleasant thing to talk about. Okay. Um, before we move on, I would like to kind of like uh, share with the listeners some of the the things that Nelson Mandela has achieved or has done during his five years uh, of presidency of South Africa. These are information that I gathered from my own research. Uh, mm -hmm. In five years, Nelson Mandela built over one million houses for, for the poor in order to, um, to take them uh, out of the... Uh, the how do how do I even use the proper term? I don't want to use um, ghetto. I believe the the proper term. Oh, you talk about it. You talk about uh, the uh, the what? what I'm, <laughs> you talk about the, the you know the thing we hurt in the in the township. Yeah, the townships. Yes, he mm. he was able to remove one million to build one million small houses for the poor to relocate them in. Uh, he was he developed a healthcare system and made it free for pregnant women and kids under under six years old to have access to health care. He provided alimonies to old people and persons with disability. Um, he built over 500 clinics that were able to to, um, to treat more than uh, 5 million people. He built, uh, he, he provided um, electricity to over 15 million house, uh, people and he uh, helped for the access of water to over 20 million people. So in five years, 20 million South Africans were able to have access to water. 15 million more were able to have access to electricity, 500 clinics, uh, free scholarship for the children of the poor, and so on and so forth. But these are some of the very little things that he did, but some Africans believe it's not enough as long as the Africans do not own the economy of South Africa. But, um, Dr. Lagoki, please, can you tell us, um, from your, from your perspective, um, why, why do you think that a lot of people in, in the African community see Mandela as being a failure instead of a success? Because the, some of the, when, I've, when I've done some of my, my research, some of the people who are accusing him uh, of being a traitor um, believe that the reason why he, uh, 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 he's a traitor because he has been celebrated by the West and the Western medias, and they see him as the friend of the enemy. And as a result, him being the friend of the enemy makes him an enemy but why do you think that people have this resentment towards him though he has achieved things that i believe most african presidents haven't been able to achieve for the past 15 years 50 years since we had our independence okay thank you very much Farid, and thank you for the for the data you gave okay. and uh, that it is very important to know too you know that you you know the data you you mentioned and um i uh I uh, this is I came across some of the data, not all of them, right? And uh, I even uh, uh, I was very, very uh, I was privileged when I read your paper that you put uh, you wrote in about Nelson Mandela. Then I discovered some of some of the data, but I knew just I knew a few of them about 
uh, 2 million people who had access you know, to electricity. Now, and it's in some of the, but also about the houses that were built in South Africa. Now, one thing uh, that uh, we need to know also when we're talking about Nelson Mandela, uh, uh, the challenge of this generation, you people have to understand what was the challenge of Nelson Mandela generation. The challenge of Nelson Mandela generation was to conquer the political power. That was the challenge of the generation. Because he lived like say, almost 100 years. So maybe he was going to need 100 more years for him to come and, and try and erase the stigma you know, of, like, of, of, of dispossession in South Africa. But the challenge of the generation was to, you know, to build, uh, 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 you know, to, to, to lead to a peaceful transition from 1990 to 1994. I was fortunate, and I watched several documentaries on Nelson Mandela, and I read several documents about Nelson Mandela from different people, even people who did not even like him. There is one documentary on YouTube called Mandela's Fight for Freedom, and there is another one called South Africa Miracle Rising. If people who are listening to me, if they go and then watch those two documentaries, they will understand why the people like um, Bill Clinton and many other people who were not particularly on the side of Mandela, why they are celebrating him today. Everything was set up in South Africa for South Africa to be, to be in a civil war. Like that was like, like, like the civil war that, is, that was experienced in Ivory Coast, my country, in the Central African Republic, uh, in, in South Sudan, in many other parts of Africa. They were doing, even during the transition, Gutelezi, the leader of Inkata, uh, in the Natal, the leader of the Zulu, uh, Lucas Mangope, and the leader of, uh, uh, of uh, I think, the Siskai, and there was another one called Uga Goko. Those three leaders wanted to secede from South Africa, and they did not want to be part of a new integrated South Africa. They wanted to take, you know, the homeland, the respective homeland that they were leaving out of South Africa. And Bukelezi, who was the most, uh, uh, you know, the, the, I, cannot, I, I don't even know the word I'm going to use, but Bukelezi was leading South Africa in a real civil war with the support of other people, like of, of, the, of the Africaners and then the right wing of Eugene Ted Blanche. That was the environment. And the images are there on YouTube, so people can go and educate themselves. So if you see the leader of the former ruling party of the, of the Bulls, if you see all, many other leaders talking about how Mandela's wisdom saved, saved South Africa, people cannot come and talk about that man like so lightly. At least they can respect that he, he, he endured like a severe pain. And then and he went through so many I, I challenges. Understand, so I understand your point. Yes, yes. I understand yes. your point. But um, we can't we can't really judge them without understanding them. And that is why um, I asked the question: Why do you think we need to ask the question? No, why no, no. don't tell yes, yes, that's what, that was, I just wanted to do that. The second now to come to your question, it is because in the in the mind, uh, if the Europeans are, uh, are celebrating you, then it means that. Uh, you, you, you know, you did a, like a, a backdoor deal that favors uh, uh, the European to the detriment of the African masses. That's their logic. And, uh, but I think that uh, uh, they are making a mistake, and I'm going to explain why. Now, because they have to understand the world, in, uh, they have to understand the history of the struggle in South Africa, they have to understand uh, Mandela's contribution. Uh, for more than, like for, five, for, for 50 years, Mandela has uh, symbolized the struggle for justice and freedom, not only in South Africa, but around the world. So freedom seekers and justice lovers around the world, blacks, whites, Asian, Indians, different types of people came together around the plight of black people in South Africa. So these are the people who over decades have maintained you know, the quest for freedom and who after Mandela who, who continued you know, to be a run of the struggle in South Africa when Mandela came out of jail. That's one, 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 one thing. Second thing people need to, to, to take into account. All the big stars that we know in the world, 
Michael Jackson, uh, uh, Ronaldo, Cristiano Ronaldo, who is one of the two best players in the world. Iniesta, who also scored the, 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 the goal for Spain to win the World Cup in 2010. All the Naomi Campbell, the, all the actresses that we know, many of them, they went to South Africa. And when they went there, they came back, or they went back to their respective nations, and all of them, each of them, has what they call the Mandela moment. They came with testimonies about how this person was uh, the embodiment of selflessness and humility. So these are the people who are talking about Nelson Mandela. It is not, it's, not, not, um, it's not just Wall Street talking about Nelson Mandela. Second thing, first thing people need to understand is this. We are in the world of Internet, the new information technology. And then when somebody creates a hashtag on, uh, of Twitter and call it Mandela, because Mandela is a brand. It's a, work, it's a brand that works. It's a brand, and many people want to be associated with the brand that is working. So uh, many of the people, the groups, the social activists, and different entities related to Nelson Mandela, they are, of course, contributing to, you know, to, to, to consolidate his legacy, but at the same time they are doing that to pursue their own personal uh, selfish agenda. So this is what people need to know. That's why he has been celebrating so much. So it is not because Mandela has failed his people, it is because he understood that by expressing forgiveness and love, because he is one of the few leaders in the 21st century and in the 20th century, you know, to put love into politics. Because people think that politics is supposed to be a dirty game where you kill, where you destroy. Mandela, when he had the power to kill and destroy, decided to forgive. So that's why he is so celebrated, because the, the, the stories of heroes that we can see in different civilizations come together, and we can see the manifestation in Nelson Mandela. Okay, thank you, Dr. Lagoki. Um, then this leads to um, my next question. Um, you know, why do you think that South Africa is still st struggling to end <coughs> racial inequality today? Well, uh, we, we are, uh, because of, uh, that's a very, that's, that's a nice question. Because, yeah. you know, one thing I wanted to, when tomorrow, you know, God gives us the opportunity to talk, talk about Mandela or about South Africa, I've seen people in Wall Street, I've seen people who are part of the problem in South Africa, in the world, celebrating, you know, the life of Nelson Mandela. But I think that, it is time for them to understand that the oppression or the exploitations of vulnerable people in South Africa, be black, white, and all the poor people in South Africa that are being exploited, you know, by those corporations. I think that if they really want to honor the life of Nelson Mandela, they need to try and put a sense of humanness in the way they conduct business. They need, it is time for them, you know, to see how to do things differently. Because the same corporations are exploiting, uh, exploiting people in South Africa. I've seen a couple of uh, months ago uh, that the government of South Africa, of Zuma, they built some houses for poor white people. And they were waiting for those houses like, for 20 years. So if uh, you know, the, 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 the white people in South Africa who dominated, you know, the, uh, you know who dominated, South Africa for all these years, we see that beyond you know, that, racial, that, that, that racial rhetoric, it is uh, about the minority, the one person uh, controlling the resources, you know, and uh, dominating 99% of the population in South Africa. And in the new dispensation of Pan-Africanism we are promoting, I think that it is, it is time for you know, those corporations to have a sense of, of citizenship, you know, to, so that they can reduce the suffering of the vulnerable people in South Africa, in Africa, and, and around the world. Okay. Uh, so, if, you know, uh, we, can, we can go from here. My next question is, you know, what do you think Mandela could have done better? Uh, that's a very, that's, I think that's a difficult, <laughs> <laughs> that, I think that's a question, I can, it is difficult for me to answer the question. Because, uh, yeah, because, uh, because, let's say, 
that when we were talking about the negotiation that I was on, uh, because when I was talking about the negotiation, I mentioned you know those two documentaries. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes you know I wish it were like uh, Mandela was strong enough, of uh, you know the leaders, uh, the NC leader were strong enough, you know, that not to compromise too much because you know it is it is, uh, it is because they have compromised too much. I try to explain the environment and the context in which you know the negotiations were conducted, but at the same time. Uh, I think that they could have asked for debt forgiveness in South Africa. Mm -hmm. The debt forgiveness in South Africa, they could have asked that to the IMF. They could have asked that to the World Bank. Mandela could have used like his uh, his charisma in, you know, the, and all the qualities he has, you know, to ask, you know, for you know maybe the consolidation of one part of South Africa debt. But in the name of the continuity of the administration, Mandela accepted in order to repay to the international uh, institution, for international financial, financial institution, the debt uh, uh, contracted by the former ruling party uh, whose uh, uh, governance was based on apartheid. I think that he could have, he could have negotiated, not to cancel okay. all the debt, but part of the debt. That's okay. something I think Mandela should have done. Okay. Or could have done. That's, a, that's a very good one. So do you, mm. do you believe that uh, in today's Africa, there is a leader that incarnates Nelson Mandela's ideologies? Uh, no, I just, we, we don't see. We don't see. We, don't, we may have many unsung heroes like, like, like Nelson Mandela, but right now I don't see uh, a leader in Africa of the for Mandela, like the statue that Mandela had. I don't, I don't see any. Okay. Uh, so what are the lessons that you believe that the current African president can learn from Nelson Mandela? Uh, so the first one is selflessness. Okay. It, 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 it's selflessness. He, he gave his life, uh, you know, for and to uh, his people. And even when he came out of jail, in one of his speeches, he said that, I, I, I put the remaining, year, the remaining years of my life in your hands. Mm -hmm. Mandela lived for his people. He was ready to die for his people. And he tried to do everything possible so that South Africa can become free. Okay. So selflessness. And the second thing we need to learn from Nelson Mandela is humility. Mm -hmm. Because humility power can corrupt like easily. Okay. And so we have so many people, the example of so many people who are denouncing the African leadership when they're given like, the, the slightest opportunity to govern or to rule, mm -hmm. they became monsters. And so they can learn that of how Mandela was detached you know, from the material world. Mm -hmm. That second thing they can learn from Nelson Mandela. Okay. Uh, once the third thing they can learn from his political, uh, uh, political pathway, uh, it is how the ANC since the beginning uh, uh, was um, uh, put into, uh, like, uh, the ANC evolved in the context of the, the Pan-African solidarity and in the context of internationalism. Okay. So if people want to, be, to undertake any type of struggle, they have to understand that this has to be done in line with the vision of Pan-Africanism mm -hmm. and have, this has to be done also in line with the necessity uh, you know, to bring together uh, different people, different groups in the world. Mm -hmm. Be black and white in the concept in the context of internationalism. Okay, Dr. Lago, Nyaka Lago, I'm going to ask you a question, who, which is a little more personal but quite related to this issue. Um, as an activist, you are fighting for the liberation of President Laurent Gbagbo, who was the former president of Cote d'Ivoire, who has been arrested and toppled during uh, uh, a French um, uh, military intervention in Cote d'Ivoire in 2011, and he's currently at the Hague, uh, in the hands of the IC. Uh, many Ivorian activists like you, um, I'm not saying that you do, but many Ivorian activists like you believe that the Laurent Gbagbo case is very similar to that of Nelson Mandela. So do you think that Laurent Gbagbo is the Nelson Mandela of Cote d'Ivoire? No, I will not. I will not, uh, I will not compare. I will not compare those the two. They have two different trajectories. Okay. And um, uh, yeah, they have two different trajectories. And uh, and um, I think it just goes two leaders. Uh, uh, some of the leaders I uh, have studied. Okay. Uh, I have, uh, two leaders I've studied, and um, it is a little bit complicated because uh, uh, the the way uh, Nelson Mandela dealt uh, with uh, West uh, with Western imperialism. 
it's a little bit different. And uh, uh, back home, when I was a journalist, I wrote an article that I called uh, uh, Laurent Babo or the Third Way, because I was believing that, uh, because we have, in the history of Africa, since the independence of Africa, we have two uh, groups of leaders in Africa. Those who decided, you know, to have a, confrontation, a confrontational relationship with the Europeans, Kwame mm -hmm. uh, Sekuture, and um, some other, many other people, mm -hmm. and there are those who decided, you know, to collaborate with the Western world. Felix Fred Boigny, Yadema, and different other people. Actually, correction, Mandel correction. Uh, yeah, uh, some of them yeah, decided to collaborate with the Western world because I don't think Yadema is a good example as he was paid by the French to make a coup d'etat in 1963. So, as a Togolese, I just needed to make that correction, if you don't mind. <laughs> No, anyway, I, I use the word collaborate, but anyway, but I will put Ufut Bwani, but let's say, anyway, I, uh, I'm, I'm going to remove uh, Yadima's name from, you know, from the book. <laughs> no I'm problem. The, yeah, uh, yeah, no problem. So Ufut Bwani and many other leading singers who decide that, you know, we, we're going to try and accommodate the Western world, and, you know, we're not going to go and be confrontational. Of, so we have those two groups of leaders in Africa. Mandela came as the third way, it's it, like the, the way of the middle, by not after, defi after defying the, you know, the Western world, when he had the power you know, to, to govern, Mandela was not in the, in the environment, or he did not decide, for instance, to attack the West all the time, because now he has become an apostle of peace, and he wanted to have, you know, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the tranquility in order to do what he has to do in the world. And by embracing uh, his victimizers and then in, uh, the people who suffer like him, so that uh, like, in unison they can, come, they can come together and propose like a song of, of, of justice and love uh, like around the world. Okay. And in that environment, we could see that some of the people who were against him, for some reason, decided not to try and destroy him any, any longer or to destroy, and destroy South Africa. So this is the third way. I thought Babo Laurent will be in that, and I wrote an article back home in when I was in Africa. But the way, the tragic fate of Babo at the end of his political, at the end of his 10-year term as a president, uh, and how, you know, he was, he was, uh, he was, uh, oh, he was obliged in order to fight for his, polit for his political uh, a legacy and his fight for his life, and then the French and the UN went to bomb the presidential palace. So we will certainly put him in a group of those leaders who had a confrontational relationship with the West, and but, but it, it happened like towards the end of his of, of his ten year term. So I will not I will not say that Babu Laurent is the Nelson Mandela of Ivory Coast. Uh, Babu Laurent is Babu Laurent. He is different, and the way I know Babu Laurent. I don't think that Babu Laurent will accept to be seen as the Nelson Mandela of Ivory Coast. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Nyakalaguki. So we will close our show. We will end our show. I'm sorry. Um, I have a, a, can I, I will have a conclusion? On a final note from you, yes, mm. I would like to have your conclusion. Mm. And as well, if possible, have your favorite quote since Nelson Mandela is your hero. What is your favorite quote on Nelson Mandela? And then you can conclude so that we end the show. Okay. Uh, uh, is it possible that, uh, can I remember my Nelson Mandela because I will remember one but, I will, but before I, I find that quote of Nelson Mandela okay. there are one thing I wanted to say as we're talking about the unfinished uh, struggle for freedom and justice in Africa okay. I think that today the most important thing for us uh, is uh, to, to, for people who are social activists is to try and continue the struggle of our heroes like Kwame Nkrumah, Thomas Sankara, Nelson Mandela, and many others, of the, Dr. King and Malcolm X, all the people who, uh, who tried uh, you know, to try and bring a sense of hope you know, to their people. So in the 21st century, when we see, for instance, corporate greed that led you know, to the fall of Wall Street in 2008, uh, when we see the power, the might of, of the of the, of, of world corporation in every 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 domestic affairs of every country in the world, I think it is time for social activists to come together around a common agenda. It can be about human rights, for instance, and you mentioned Babo, 
people who believe in freedom and justice, I think that today, irrespective of what we can think about Laurent Babo, it is possible for people to come together and try and fight for the release of Laurent Babo. Because Alassane Ramawatra is in power, but was the one who brought the war to Ivory Coast, and Alassane Ramawatra, warlords are not in jail. And Laurent Babo, who happened to be one of the people fighting, is like right now like at the Hague uh, in the ICC jail. So we can organize around the, 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 you know, the, the free Laurent Babo's movement. This is one thing. Second, uh, we see that people are rising up again in Burkina Faso. Bless Compaway killed the Thomas Sankara and then the 26 or 27 years ago and Thomas Sankara was one of the greatest hopes in Africa killed by Bless Compaway who in 26 or 27 years did not bring any kind of development to Burkina Faso. We can organize around, uh, around a struggle for freedom and justice and Bless Compaway want to change the constitution to run again for president for maybe for five more years and after those five more years, he wants to give the power to his brother. So we cannot accept that. And people who yesterday were against Laurent Babo, or people who are for freedom and justice, I think that we can organize with our brothers and sisters in Burkina Faso. Second thing. Third thing, uh, I mentioned the debt, the debt cancellation. It is possible for us to fight you know, for, for the cancellation of the African country's debt. And the third, fourth thing, we can fight for corporate social responsibility. These are those four things I mentioned can be uh, the tenets of a new struggle in the 21st century or in the year 2014. And also, we can uh, undertake a new dispensation of Pan-Africanism around the certain says those, 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 those things. Now, one of the quotes I saw by, by Nelson Mandela that I like, I don't know if I will, uh, uh, I will, uh, I will remember it. It is uh, uh, what, when he said that... Uh, 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 let me, if I cannot find it, let me pass. You see, when somebody comes, he said that when somebody, it's a life, it's a, it's a life, you know, it's a death is inevitable. When somebody does what he has to do for his people, he can, uh, he can have a sense that, you know, he's, uh, he has accomplished what he has to do. And then he, Mandela said, I think I've made that effort and therefore, I can sleep in eternity. This is uh, one of the most beautiful quotes that I like, and there are several I love, but I love particularly that one, and because uh, it shows, uh, it summarizes uh, what uh, he wanted to do for his generation, and then also what he thinks that he was supposed to do that he did, and how he may be uh, remembered in the history. So now, as we were, as I was talking, this is what I, I found it, but let me read it now. He said, when a man has done what he considered to be his duty to his people and his country, he can rest in peace. I believe I've made that effort, and that is therefore why I will sleep for the eternity. So I love it. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Nyakalaguki. We really appreciate having you today. We hope to have the chance, you know, to, have to, to welcome you back on Stereon Radio uh, for us to discuss your work with the... Um, uh, revival of the African uh, of Pan Africanism Forum. It was a great show today. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so, very much, Farida, for your great work. Thank you very much for the you privilege. You are so welcome. Thanks again. So, dear listeners, thank you uh, for listening to our show. We hope you enjoyed it, and we hope that you will be uh, tuned in um, next week for us to dis keep discussing the politics of Africa. And I'm not sure which country will be on by Wednesday, but please just visit our Facebook page, Countdown with Farida, and then you'll have a chance to have the latest updates on Countdown. And in case you want to re-listen to the show, we'll be very happy to post the upcoming uh, um, podcast uh, on, on, on our website. So before we close uh, this beautiful discussion, before we end the show, I would like to share with you guys my favorite quote of Nelson Mandela, uh, which mm -hmm. says, money won't create success, the freedom to make it will. So dear listeners, thank you once again.